Hello again, I'm excited. So just to give you a brief overview of this talk, don't try to focus too much on the code. Um, I just really just want to give you like a sweeping introduction to Grid, like what's cool about Grid and why Grid is the new thing. And again, like my idea is Grid is not going to replace everything else out there, but there's some really interesting features and cool things that you could do with Grid. So yeah, we're going to talk about uh, CSS Grid, but before we do, I think like in order to properly introduce Grid, we need to like take a step back into like old school web development. And so if you've been building anything with the web for any period of time, you probably rem uh, remember tables, not like displaying data with tables, but literally building layout with tables. So I like sifted through my archives, and this is a markup from my website back in 2007. It's literally just like a fixed width layout. Uh, and for the fixed width web back in the day, and I mean us developers and designers, we're really good at doing this, but whatever tools we had it, at our disposal, we just like kind of made it work. We like hacked around it and we made it work. But it, it became a problem when mobile became more of a thing, like fixed width websites just was inaccessible. It just broke on uh, a myriad of devices. And so as CSS began to advance and become uh, better for layout, this thing called floats came into play. And my guess is many of you, if not all of you, are probably have built something with floats if you've built websites that work with CSS. And floats are a whole lot better than tables because you know, there are many ways to make floats work and on m multiple devices, and you can obviously make it responsive. But it also has this like quirks and limitations. So I'm just going to go on like a, a tiny little rant. So like there's this thing called clear fix. So every time you put an element inside of another parent element and then you float it to the left or right, like the parent element doesn't account for the height that's inside. So it just like everything just starts collapsing and like wrapping around and floating. And so there, there's this like CSS hack called clear fix. And every single parent container with anything that's floating, you have to clear fix it. And it just became extremely annoying. So if you go back like even further into like the earlier days of ClearFix, this is like the disgusting markup that you had to put on every single parent element. It's just like not ideal. Um, how about like the, for me, it was like the biggest gripe and the bane of CSS ever is vertical centering. Like I don't know why it is so hard to take one dumb element and make it centered vertically, but it was like nearly impossible. So if you like look at this example, we're using CSS to go back to it like mimicking and working like a table because if you go back to tables, tables do, does vertical centering like extremely well. And again, it's a hack. So with like transforms, this was like a more modern way of vertical centering. But again, this is still ridiculous and dumb. It shouldn't be this hard. So then came like Flexbox. Flexbox is like basically like magic. So in this example, we have this like four column grid, two lines of CSS, and it like just works. You have like four columns. This is like magical, right? And the reason why Flex was so great is because we have this additional CSS module that works with it called box alignment. And so as an extension of the previous example, let's say we have a, a Flex container of 200 pixels high, and instead of all the elements stretching across the height of the uh, container, I just wanted to start at the top. So you have um, this align items property, and all you need to do is set it to flex start, and boom, it just like pins to the top, and it works great. And then even more box alignment magic, right? You have using the align self properties, and then all these different values. You can have it pinned to the top, you can have it vertically centered, which is magical, pinned to the bottom, or just stretched straight across. And then let's say instead I just want the the items to be 15% wide, and I just want to like evenly space them out across. So you have like another property called justify content property. You just set the value to space between, and then like again, it like just works. This was like wonderful for Flexbox. But again, like all things with tables, floats, and with Flexbox, like even Flexbox has its limitations. So we're just going to like roll back and say, go back to the four column grid. And instead, I want to add gutters. I just want gutters, and I want all the items to be just evenly spaced out. So with Flexbox, there's multiple ways of doing it, but it makes sense to like take every item and just add a margin of 1M or, what, or whatever value, right? 
but we've also created another problem. So all the way around the flex container, we have a margin of one M, but because two items are against each other and they, all, and, and they each have a margin of one M, now there's two Ms. So we have like inconsistent spacing. So what do we do? So we have a way to do it. You take the flex container, you add a padding of one M to try to like normalize the spacing. Okay, cool. Like I have a container, I have all of my items evenly spaced out and I can start like building a grid. So I wanna add four more items to this grid and I wanna put it on the next row. So I add four items and like, what the heck, right? Like I told it to be 25% wide. I have eight items, it should be like four on the top and then it should kind of like wrap to the next. But no, Flexbox is designed to be one dimensional. So you think of the flex direction property in Flexbox, you can only set it to rows and columns, but there's like no way to do rows and columns. So there is this property called flex wrap, and you can kind of like force the flex to say, if you start running out of room, go ahead and wrap to the next. And so it kind of like causes like a snaking effect. So I'm gonna go ahead and set flex wrap, and then like, now there's only three items on the top row. It's like, what is this madness? Like th this, this, this is just ridiculous. And so as a designer working with CSS on a daily basis, like. This is the kind of stuff that just drives me crazy. I just want to take my head and just like bang it against the wall a few times and like hope that it just works. So we have this thing called grid, right? And I don't know, maybe a few years later there'll be something else and grid is gonna have problems too. But the major difference between uh, grid and Flexbox is grid is designed to be two dimensional. So as opposed to Flexbox where it's just rows and columns, uh, grid is designed to work with columns and rows simultaneously. So a quick example, if you want to create a grid container, uh, you have this like new value for the display property called grid or inline grid, depending. And if you notice that in comparison to Flexbox, Flexbox by default aligns items in columns, whereas uh, by default, if you just drop display grid, it sets all of the items in rows. So now we're gonna start defining a grid. So here we're explaining what's called an explicit grid and there's also an implicit grid, which I'm not gonna talk about, but here we have an explicit grid and we're telling it to sit, create column tracks and row tracks. So I have two different properties, the grid display, uh, grid template rows and grid template columns properties. And we have two different uh, row set of 100 pixels high each and then two columns at 200 pixels wide as well. But if you're noticing, these are uh, fixed width values. And so we're talking about the responsive webs. Well, Grid also has this, it introduces a new unit, which is really, really cool, called the FR, or the fraction. So it's very similar to uh, the Flexbox unit list values, and FR represents the fraction of the available space in the, uh, across the grid container. So th in this example, we have two uh, columns defined at one FR each. So it's just gonna take all of the available space in the grid container, separate it into two sections, and then just evenly distribute it across uh, the columns. And then here you can also combine FR with like other length values. So here we have an example on the third column, there's a 50 pixel fixed width column. And then with the remaining space, it's gonna divide it up into three sections because there's the, the first column will be one FR and the second is two, and then it's just gonna distribute it amongst the columns. It's a really, really cool way to create a grid. There's this also min max function. It's this new function you can use inside of the value uh, when defining grid sizes. So you can tell it to have like a minimum size and a maximum size. And the default value is auto based on like the content. But if you start adding content, it'll grow automatically. And the cool thing is with the maximum value of 300 pixels, once it hits 300 pixels, the content will just like overflow. So in this grid example, we uh, defined only one grid track, uh, a row track, excuse me. So you have a grid template rows and there's only one value of 100 pixels, but we have six items in this uh, grid. So once it goes past the first row, it's gonna default to auto because we've only defined one row track size. So in order for the, in order for the other two rows to have the same sizes, we have to define uh, row tracks explicitly for every single row. And this can get kind of verbose. So grid has this neat thing called a repeat function, which is also useful. So 
like exactly the same as the previous example. You have this function that uh, you use that accepts two arguments. So the first one, you say, I want three columns to repeat, and then the second argument is the size, so 100 pixels. So you see it's the same exact example as it before, except it's a whole lot less verbose. And then you can also combine the repeat function with other track fixed width values or flexible values. So here you have the first and last columns at 30 pixels. And then in between, instead of defining like 1FR, 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 I'm just saying, OK, let's repeat three columns at 1FR each. And then it's just going to distribute it, uh, the, the available space across the defined columns. So we have grid gaps. I, the frustration about Flexbox, about evenly spacing out the items, grid gap uh, solves all of these issues. So here we have a defined grid, and there's two different properties, the grid row gap and the grid column gap. And the wonderful thing is it doesn't touch the outer edge of the grid container. It, no, it's smart enough to say, OK, I just want to evenly space out the actual items, and I don't need to add additional uh, spacing around the container, which is really cool. Yay. Oh, excuse me. I got so excited. Uh, grid gap is just a shorthand function. If you just put one value in, it'll evenly set uh, the spacing for rows and columns. Another cool thing is you have, you're able to also position grid items on a grid. So for example, we have this grid, and we want to take item number one, and let's say we just want to put it where number four is. We just want it to swap places. So now we introduce some more properties, the grid row start and the grid column start properties. And you'll notice we have these numbers. So what do these numbers represent? When you have a grid defined, also grid lines are created at the start, at the middle, and at the end of the columns and rows. So visually, it may be a little hard to see, but you'll see those lines like starting from, uh, if you're looking at the column track, starting from the left, it'll be line number one. The middle is line number two, and the end is line number three. And same thing with rows, one, two, three, four. And you can use these numbers as references to position and move around um, items on a grid, which is really, really cool. And here, we can also use ending numbers. So you can say, I want you to start at this line of this row, or this line of this column, and I want you to end. So by default, columns, um, excuse me, Grid items only span one row or one column. So in this example, it's not necessary, but there would be specific situations where you say, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to span two rows or two columns. And again, there's different properties to kind of make it easier. So there's a grid row shorthand property. So you have two values. The first one is the start line number, and the second is the end line number, and then you have just this forward slash to separate the values. And then even more crazier, you have a grid area shorthand function, and that takes care of all four. So the first two are the row start and column start numbers, and then the last two are the row end and the column end numbers, and just all separated by four slashes. Like I just said uh, moments ago, you can take grid items and you can say, I don't want it to just span one column or row, I want it to span more across the grid, which is also really neat, which is very difficult to do with Flexbox. So here you'll notice that um, the values of the start and end numbers are more than one away. So like I said, by default, they only span one column and one row. But as long as you take the end number and you just, you know, as long as there's more than one number away, it's just going to go ahead and spread itself across the grid however you define it, which is really, really cool. And again, you can do the same thing with the grid row and grid column shorthand properties. Just make sure to set the end number, just an additional row line or more away. There's also um, a keyword you can use. Instead of trying to remember like which line I should end at, all you can say is, I wanted to start at row number, row uh, line number one and just span two items. So it'll just take care of it automatically. Same thing with columns. Even crazier, you can take these lines that um, are numbered, and then you can actually like give it names to give it a little more context. And then you can use those names to position grid items. So uh, a basic example here is you're taking templates and rows. You're defining them with sizes, but you also have these uh, grid names, and so um, line names. So the line names should be surrounded by square brackets and like relative to where they would be positioned based on where you're defining these columns and rows. Uh, 
And it's good practice to, you can name them whatever you want, um, but it's good practice to use the hyphen start and hyphen end and append it at the end because there's some like additional implicit added benefits that I'm gonna touch on just a bit later. And then you, again, like I mentioned before, you can use those line names to position these items. So you're telling it to start at row two start instead of number two, line number two. And then a, another example with the shorthand properties and also using the span keyword. Another really cool thing, like taking this even further, is now you're naming grid areas. You can take like an entire block or a section of a grid and like say, I want this to be the header or I want this to be the footer. And then you can like take items and like position them into the appropriate places. So here, this is just an example. You, uh, we have the grid template areas property and then you're using like the syntax to say, I have two columns on the first row and that entire block, I wanna name it header. And then on the second row, I have content on the left, sidebar on the right, and on the last row, I just want the entire block to be named footer. And then while we define these names, you can use these names to then start positioning and creating the grid. So here you'll notice I have these elements. I have header content sidebar footer, and I have, I'm using a grid area property, and I'm just popping in the name, and it just kind of like locks into place. And you'll notice from the previous example that I have no grid areas names um, assigned for any of those elements. So it's just gonna like automatically say, okay, I'm just gonna put it in the first spot, second spot, third spot, fourth spot, because there are four um, areas defined, but not given names, like cells are created. But once you start giving it a little more directions to say, okay, I want this grid area to be located in the header, it just kind of like locks into place. Really cool. You can also, um, I mentioned before that if you start naming grid lines with uh, the hyphen start and hyphen end at the end, you have like these added benefits, meaning it implicitly knows like because you're using those names, it's gonna um, create like boundaries for these names and then also like automatically create grid areas. And then you can use those line names or you can use those automatic line areas to start like positioning items. So you'll, you'll notice here that uh, once you create a grid area, it's gonna automatically create these line names for you with dash start and dash end, and then you can start using those uh, as references to also position items. So you have like um, an array of different combinations and ways and context within this grid that was never uh, possible back then uh, to be able to like start building uh, your site and whatever app. So what does grid support look like? Grid support is uh, actually su surprisingly pretty good. So this is just a screenshot from canIuse.com that I took a couple days ago. And you'll notice the partial support for our IE and Edge. Uh, surprisingly, the spec for grid came from Microsoft. So it's been in development for over five years. And because the spec has kind of like evolved, it's kind of fallen behind. But I believe, uh, my understanding is Edge will catch up and I'm not 100% sure about IE. But it's pretty supported. And here's just like a, a basic example of what you may do in your CSS. So let's say I'm gonna use Flexbox because Flexbox is a whole lot better supported, but I also wanna progressively enhance for grid. So this is like one example using the at support uh, at rule in CSS. You can say if, it's a, if it supports grid, then go ahead and take this container and display it as grid as opposed to Flexbox. A uh, great resource for CSS Grid is the Mozilla Developer Network spec. So that is something that I referenced um, during my study of CSS Grid. Either you can memorize that URL or just look up MDN CSS Grid layout and it's like the first example. If you're interested in following people on Twitter, Jen Simmons and Rachel Andrew are uh, two ladies that had a huge part in especially writing and giving direction of CSS Grid. And so without them, I, I feel like you know, CSS Grid has gotten to where it is because of their help. So they've been a great resource. And lastly, I worked my tail off this week to get this out because I felt bad. Like I'm showing you all this code and there's no way to like keep track of it. So I wanted to be like at the end of the talk, like go here and if you're ever interested in learning more about CSS Grid, this is a great resource. And so feel free to go to learncssgrid.com. I launched it earlier today, so it's available for you to check out and if you, interested you can uh, follow me on john 2 on twitter and so yeah that's basically it
thanks uh, so much for talking or listening.